beautiful morning, isn't it, church? Praise the Lord. Awesome. Awesome. Well, today, well, first off, today, I'm going to try to see how long I can go here. We'll see. This will even work here. Well, it looks like I'm going all big boy voice today. I don't know what's going on with this thing. So I'll do my best to have you guys hear me. If you ever can't hear me, just do this or something like that. So that way I know uh, how to be able to, not know to be able to raise my voice or whatever. So, all right. Well, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the provision of God, but... Uh, as those of you that I've met the last the previous times I've been here, I think this is my fourth or fifth time preaching for Mark. Uh, you know what I always start off with. Early on, when I felt like the Lord might be calling me to do some sort of preaching in the future, or when I really desired that, uh, the, basically I made a promise and a covenant with the Lord that I would always start off with this scripture and with this preface. The scripture being the book of Acts, 1711. Acts 1711 reads that those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they not only received Paul's, the Apostle Paul's words, but then they searched the scriptures daily to find out if what he said is true. So if anybody is up here, Mark, myself, whoever, I don't care what platform, I don't care what kind of what, what kind of church or anything like that, listen for the Spirit of Christ. Be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11 where they received Paul's words, but then searched the Scriptures daily to see if what he said was true. And so don't just swallow anything that I say whole. Get with the Lord about it. It's all about personal relationship with Him. And so that being said, I'm going to go right into the Scripture. I guess another preface, I wasn't originally going to do this preface, but uh, I just kind of knew the scripture and a little bit of what I was going to talk about. I don't really have an outline or any of the things like I have in the past. I just felt like I was meant to come in and the Lord will unwrap it as Amen. I go along. So we'll see what happens. But the scripture, for those of you that have your Bibles or on the phone or whatever else, or just so you can read it later, like what I was saying, is... 2 Corinthians, so it's Paul that I just mentioned, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. For the love of Christ controls us, some versions say constrains us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh and mortal body. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. So therefore, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be ye reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So in my own life, this passage, especially 517, has been a big verse because uh, when I first came to know the Lord, it was 2007, I was 22 years old, I was going to fuel out there at Eastview, and I didn't realize it, but my life, my heart actually was in shambles. See, I had grown up 
I told Pastor Mark this is going to be more, more testimonial than anything. See, I had grown up uh, just uh, in a certain way where I was outcasted by a lot of people, where I was constantly trying to strive to gain respect. I was constantly trying to please people. I had resentment issues. I had all sorts of different lust and anger and all sorts of different greed and all sorts of different things that I kind of knew was wrong with me, but I didn't really consider it wrong with me. It's these people that are wrong, not me, and all this other stuff. But verse 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Amen. The old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I would read that, and I'd have one of my mentors, Andrew Whalen, would uh, constantly reassure me of that, but I just kind of was like, how am I going to get there, pretty much? How am I going to become a person that's pure? How am I going to become a person that's loving? How am I going to become just one of these Christian guys like Andrew and whatever else when I'm just Dewey? Or you could even say that about yourself. I'm just whoever you are. Katie, Ashley, Brenda, anybody. <laughs> But I wanted to take a look at God's provision in the midst of that. You see, whenever you, uh, let me take care. If you were to actually be able to talk to a caterpillar and tell him, hey, you little caterpillar that's just crawling on the ground, nobody thinks of you highly or whatever else, you're going to become a butterfly that all these people are going to chase and whatever else is going to be beautiful. You know, that caterpillar would look at you and say, he'd be like, you're out of your mind. <laughs> you really think I'm going to become that? A caterpillar would look at the promise that you just made them and sit and laugh. Would think, no, there's no way that that's going to happen. He doesn't believe you. And this got brought up in a Bible study the other day that some things you don't even have to believe. God's just already set it in motion. He's already made provision. And so from the very beginning of time, how God orchestrated all of nature, he set it in motion that the caterpillar would come to life out of its egg. And then as you look at how a caterpillar, I actually studied this, preparing for this, uh, goes into motion, somewhat studied, uh, about two to three weeks, the caterpillar is just gorging on everything it can eat. It's just feeding, feeding, feeding. And then finally there comes a time where it gets wrapped in a cocoon. In this case, it's its own cocoon because it makes its own cell. It's wrapped in the cocoon on its tree. It has no clue what it's doing. It doesn't really, it, it, it just knows that it's doing what it needs to do to survive. It all of a sudden realizes, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be doing this instead. And so it just goes with nature, it just does what it can to survive. And it wraps itself in the cocoon with its own silky mixture. And then in that cocoon process, what happens is there's actually pressure. There's actually, in our life, there's pressure. There's trials. In the cocoon process, there's pressure. And there's all sorts of different transformations where, for many caterpillars, they actually become ooze in this little chrysalis feature that's almost like an egg within the cocoon. And they have plates that they were grown with, discs that they were grown with, that, uh, I'm sorry, they were born with, that they grow with, that actually start to reform that ooze that was the caterpillar into a butterfly. And then, I can't remember the exact time frame, but that butterfly, that caterpillar goes through the process, and then all of a sudden the wings start to come out and it starts to bust out of the cocoon. And I believe it's seven hours that it has to stay on the tree limb before its wings are strong enough to actually fly. And that's the butterfly that's made. And so when I look at our life, what I think of is a, we start off in a state, a certain state, and God's made the provision through several different areas, the pressure, the cocoon, if you will, that will turn us into the new creation. Amen. So I wanted to back up again and go back through and just kind of go through each verse to kind of pick this apart. 
So Paul's saying the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, and the conclusion is that if one died for all, then therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So I believe the first part of the cocoon that is our transformation in our life is Christ's love right there. We see it right here that he died for us, that he was selfless. He died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So because Christ seen the condition that we were in as the uh, glorious day, I believe it is, it could have been a different song, says when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth as a virgin. Jesus came through, walked his life. Many people say it's the only Christian life. The Christian life is impossible. Only one man can actually live it and live sinlessly. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So the very first ingredient is his love saying, hey, you know what? I already have my glory up here. I already have tons of glory, but I'm going to shed all of it and become a man so that way I can win you back because I love you so much. So therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then here's another big point that I want to make in this one. He made him. That's kind of strange. What are you talking about? He, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. How I feel like we unpack it right now is just basically saying that God has made provision through all sorts of different ways, through Christ's love and through He is. What God the Father is saying in that instance right there, He's saying, you know what? I am making you, Jesus my Son, to become sin for them. Why? Because I want more sons and daughters. Jesus is looking at a bride, a church, love. Jesus is looking at being able to love them and have them love him back. But what God the Father is instead looking at is, no, I want sons and daughters. I want a family. I want people that become the righteousness of God. And so... What I want to say is that the cocoon process that we become a new creation in, I believe in our life, is life in and of itself. Is the situations, the circumstances, the trials, all the different things that we go through in life, I think that is our very cocoon that God does the work in. And that I don't, I don't really have like a perfect analogy to be able to say this is this and this is that, but I believe mixed in that cocoon is Christ's love for us and our will to love him back. And then it, through that provision, God said, okay, I made him sin, knowing that this provision would happen, that Christ loved them and they would love him back. And through that provision, I'm going to make them the righteousness of God. Whether they believe it or not, I'm going to make them like Jesus. As long as they keep loving him, he of course already loves them, then they are going to go through the cocoon. They are going to go through circumstances. They are going to go through trials. They are going to go through tribulations that they aren't going to know what to do. They aren't going to know how to react. They aren't going to know how to become this new creation. 
But instead, as they keep living for me and loving me and my son, Jesus, then what's going to happen is they will become this new creation because I, God the Father, have made it that way, have Amen. set it in motion. Just like he set in motion the caterpillar just tries to survive. Oh, that's all it's trying to do. And it gets wrapped in the cocoon and becomes a butterfly. He has set in motion the things in your life to make you like Christ. That's the very first point. That, that's what's burning on my heart right now to be able to share with you guys. I, when Mark asked me, I wasn't sure if I was going to preach. I've been in a whole different life with a lot of different things going on. And he actually gave uh, the Lord like that. There was a, it was, I think it was a Friday night that Mark asked me. And then like that night, I went and had a dream where I was at this church speaking about my old life and speaking about pro wrestling to Jesus, and so on and so forth. And so that is what I feel is uh, the main message that God wants you to know, is that no matter how far off being like Christ seems, that it's very attainable and that God himself will get you there. Amen. Just keep walking, just keep loving him. Right. And so first and foremost, I'm going to break down some of my life. I might have shared some of the story, at least, at least the part with my mom, one of my first times here. But uh, in 2007, I became a Christian. I believed that there was a God and called myself a Christian before then, but I had never truly repented of my sin and said, no, my life is now following Jesus from here on out. And so, with that being said, uh, I became a Christian. I started following the Lord. And before my life in Christianity, in following Jesus, I should say, I was a pro wrestler. That was the very thing that I thought would get me respect, that I thought would get me to pay for my house in cash and all this other stuff. I love being able to go to the ring and being able to put on a show for people and let me hear you and all this other stuff. And I thought that's what was going to get people to like me. I thought that was going to be how people would respect me was being a pro wrestler. You can look up Dewey Dawson. That's not my real last name, obviously. But Dewey Dawson there uh, on the YouTube, and you'll see pro wrestling stuff of me wrestling around in a pro wrestling ring. And so from there, uh, there came time, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but my grandma on my mom's side, she uh, had been having some health problems, and she was one of the faithful ones in our family. And she, uh, with, uh, long story short, she ended up passing away July 31st of 2008. And there was a lot of different amazing details that go on with that, where from her passing away, I got to see my Uncle Danny, my Uncle Mark and his whole family start having Bible study, go on a retreat, like what we were talking about earlier. This retreat is called the Great Banquet. It used to be called the Walk to Mass Retreat. And then in March of 2010, I got to see my Uncle Mark and my Uncle Danny give their lives to Jesus. Right there. Actually, after having pizza. <laughs> and so, but what made that possible was my decision to, in the midst of my cocoon, in the midst of my tough circumstance, was my decision to continue to love God more than I love pro wrestling. To continue to follow him no matter what the circumstance. See what happened was uh, my uncle Danny, my cousin Harley, a lot of these different people uh, were wanting to know about Christ as we were preparing for the funeral and I was getting ready to share the funeral. And then my cousin Harley basically said, well I don't think God would have you, you know, cutting yourself and all the stuff that you do in pro wrestling. For those that don't know, in pro wrestling, of course, we all, we, by now, most people know that most matches are predetermined, that it's a storyline, that it's a performance mm -hmm. rather than a sporting event. That's why I call it sports entertainment. So how they bleed is a thing called blading. I don't want to share the whole process for anybody that might, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's basically, long story short, uh, wrapping it enough, uh, wrapping a razor blade enough in your tape that you have like a pencil lead thickness of the razor blade showing. And so when it comes time to the match, you're, oh, you're getting hit. Oh, the chair's about to come, so you slip it out of your wrist. Boom, chair hits, and you cut yourself. 
And so that's how they bleed in pro wrestling. And that's exactly in August 5th, I believe it was, when I was talking to my cousin Harley, and he basically had me promise him that I would no longer do that September of that year. And I didn't even know. I don't know if it was this date. That would be crazy. But September of that year, I was scheduled to do just that in a match. And so I was between a rock and a hard place. Do I have the other guy cut me so I'm technically not breaking the promise? Do I go ahead and do it, break the promise, and not have Harley listen to me at all about Jesus? What do I do? And finally, it was like the Lord was saying, like, in this pressure, in this cocoon, choose me. You've been choosing pro wrestling because you thought that if you give up on it, you're giving up on your, your future. But instead, I have your future. And I will map out your life the way I desire and what's best for you. So I ended up telling the guy, nope, I can't even do that in a match. Not even, gosh, was it not even six months? No, it was a less than a year later, I was out of pro wrestling. I went from the very thing that held me back, that I thought would give me the most respect, to being completely done with it. The very thing that was an idol in my life, to being completely done with it. And so I say that because I was so worried about what was going to happen, about my circumstance. I mean, I could go on and on throughout my life. I, uh, I was fired from a job in 2012, and I was worried about circumstance. I, uh, many of you know that I used to deliver, I used to deliver pizza for prime time and they just closed down. But in all those pressures and all that cocoon of life circumstances, God is not worried about whether it's going to be good or bad. I think of how some people, what can I do to be able to make my life good? How can I get from God to just make my life good and nice and easy? Why, why isn't life good? Why, I just want things to be good. It's going to be all bad in a matter of days. I just want things to be good. And God's saying, I'm not worried about your life being good or bad. What I'm worried about is your character in these situations. And I'm worried about you becoming the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So in this situation, are you going to look at the situation? Are you going to worry about your life and try to take your own life? Are you going to try to do these different things that will lead you away from me? Whether it be cheat people, whether it be steal from people, whether it be whatever kind of things to be able to make your own provision? Or are you going to look towards me and say, I'm not going to do those things. I'm going to continue to follow God. What I want to say, I'll just go ahead and share this as well. The last year I've been that pizza delivery driving, of course the place is closed down. I want to say that at times I felt like it was the furthest I've been from Christ, many times. Just because the environment was so crazy that I mean, I couldn't even tell you the bad customer service that was there, the crookedness so many different times between people, and just as well as just the party scene, as well as the temptations that were there, and all sorts of different stuff. And, I mean, I heard stories of people that would uh, just, I don't even want to share the story, but just different things. I was like, man, that is literally just crooked, what this guy just did. But in all of that, instead of getting into a situation and trying to figure out the circumstance, just trying, in my trying to survive in Christ, I chose what would Jesus do. I think of a time where... Uh, my manager had already cashed out the receipts for credit cards, and I had two that I hadn't given in to him yet. He said, well, I guess I'll just pay into it. And so usually the old me would have been like, all right, cool. Like, I'm going to take advantage of him like the other guys have taken advantage of him or whatever else. Or there's times where, you know, somebody gives you cash, $2 cash for the tip, and they write $2 on there thinking, oh, yeah, I gave him a $2 tip. And so many guys would be like, all right, now I've got $4 instead of the two. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But so many times I'd be like, no, like, I have to follow Jesus in this. I'm going to be honest. And so from there, that is a witness unto those people, and that will help to shape your character. And I can tell you that there's many opportunities. I mean, I have the old owner of Primetime wanting me to start a business doing the personal training one-on-one. -on -one and all sorts of different opportunities that can come. But 
God wants you to go through the cocoon before you can become the new creation. And so that's, honestly, I, as I was preparing this and as I was feeling this, I just hope that I've given you some sort of a vision towards who you can be in Christ and how that's done. I believe that it's not your plan or your works that will get you to this end goal of becoming a new creation. That instead, as you just follow Christ and just seek to live like He does, that God will bring you there. And for those that are going through hard times right now, I mentioned all bad in a matter of days and stuff like that. I know people that are going through that right now. I just want to say that all things work together for the good of those who love Christ. That he's made that provision right there. Even the bad circumstances, even the sufferings and everything else, all things work together for the good of those who love Christ. So all it is in your pressure, in your situation, in your cocoon of life circumstances that's going to change you, that you don't see as cocoon, you just see it as barriers, you just see it as darkness, you just see it as trial and tribulation, God says, just continue to survive. Just continue to love me. That's what it takes to survive. Just continue to set your will and your heart to follow me. The provision to being a new creation is simply verses 15 and 21. Sandwiched in between those is 17. 15. He died for all. He died for love. Died for you and me. So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That reciprocal transaction right there. I have it in my Bible as a two-way selflessness. You, I think some people have heard the story where there's two different people, two different groups, in two different rooms. All the people are have spoons for their hands, or like spoons strapped to their hands, if I remember correctly. The first group is trying their hardest to be able to get the food into their mouths, but the spoon is so long that they can't reach their mouths with the food. And so they keep trying, they keep trying, but they just can't do it. They just can't feed themselves. The spoon's too long. It's it's just too awkward. It just isn't happening. And so they were malnourished and skinny and about to die. And then the next room you look in, you see these people well fed. And you're like, what's going on with them? And you see them feeding. They learn how to feed each other with the spoons instead of trying to just feed themselves. And so in this, God is saying that as you learn in those cocoon life circumstances, those tough circumstances where it's all dark, and all bad in a matter of days and whatever else, God is saying that all you have to do is learn how to no longer live for yourself, but for me, who died and rose again on your behalf. And if you keep doing that transaction, that process, what's going to happen is the new butterfly that we will become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to finish up with just a prayer. And if anybody has anything else on their heart to, to receive, to pray, anything they want to share, anything like that, I'm always free for that. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and pray. God, I just want to thank you first for who you are, for your provision, Lord, that all things work together for the good of those who love God. That you enacted that so that way God... You love us, and we would love you back. All things would work for our good and for our new creation. Hallelujah. So God, I pray that you would give us that vision, that sight. Lord, no matter how much we mock it, no matter how much we doubt it, God, that instead of setting limits on ourselves, that we'd be able to just say, nope, I am going to live for you who died and rose again on my behalf. And so I'm going to go through this circumstance I'm going to go through this trial. I'm going to go through this darkness. I'm going to go through this just in the midst of it, just trying to follow you and your precepts, trying to treat each other fairly, faithfully, and any sort of sin.
comes up, I will repent of it and try my best to continue to follow you and love you, Lord. And I know that in the midst of that, what's going to happen is a person that's no longer greedy, is a person that's no longer worried about provision and therefore steals, is a person that no longer has lust or anything like that, but instead trusts God to provide a partner or for singleness is a person that is no longer arrogant, that looks at others and tries to puff up my own self, is no longer prideful or anything else, but in all of that I shall become instead like you. And the hope of glory, Christ in me, the hope of glory, shall come out leading others to you. So God, we just declare, anybody that, uh, that feels this in their heart can declare this in your heart with me. We just declare that we're going to follow you all the days of our life, in every circumstance, in every situation, that we will walk how you walk, Lord, even in the crazy circumstances and environments and situations, that in the midst of it, we're just going to love you back and follow you and become that new creation. So God, I just pray a blessing over each and every single person that's here. God, I pray that this word take deep root in every one of our hearts, Lord, and that even beyond that, Lord, that there be seeds in each heart, whatever sticks out, God, that we'd be able to, to have more information and revelation from you later on as we do that Acts 17, 11, and get with you later about all this, Lord. So God, I thank you, I love you, Lord, and it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Give me a closing song. Like that. I thought you were just finishing. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Praise the Lord for good worship and good prayer. Uh, a thought came to me as we were worshiping right before I, we dismiss. Uh, I was mentioning how all things work together for the good of those who love God. Just how when it's in cocoon, we have no clue how that butterfly is going to look. While we're in the cocoon, we have no clue how that good is going to look. So I can't promise you however it's going to look. When I went through the whole pro wrestling thing, I had no clue how that was going to look. When I went through the whole being fired from an arts thing, I had no clue how that was going to look. I have no clue how it's going to look right now. So many opportunities popping up. But I do know this, that I can say in my life that God is faithful. Amen. He brings about the good. Amen. Just keep on with that vision of loving Him back the same way He loves you. Amen. And that the good and the new creation will undoubtedly happen. Amen. Amen. You guys are free to be dismissed. Be blessed. Hey, buddy. I love you, Mark. Sometimes. <laughs> oh, he's beautiful. 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 Oh, he's very immature at the same time. Yeah. So what I said was that I was pregnant. I don't yeah. know if you knew that, right. and um, and so I said, well, when baby Wyatt's born, you're going to be older than him, yeah. and you always will be. He's like, but he'll turn four and be the same age as me, and there was no way to like. That's yeah, just a that. concept he can't get. Yeah, yeah. Lydia was throwing so over it. Was no, I, the uh, furnace off. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, the ball at me. So, yeah, I mean, and my brother and his wife.